The large white building in the distance began life as the Kew Lunatic Asylum. It was one of the largest asylums ever built in Australia. The place had a very chequered history with lots of weird reports and plenty of inquiries throughout its 117 years of operation. It was eventually closed down in 1988 and has since become a heritage-listed residential estate called Willsmere. The Yarra River winds through the suburbs like an old brown snake on a sunny day. This is the section of the Yarra which experienced the first crossing of the river by cattle in 1836. They came overland from New South Wales to the newly established Port Phillip district. Keynes Bridge is a pedestrian single span suspension bridge, or swing bridge as people like to call it. When you stand on it, you realise it does swing and move quite a bit, especially when other people walk or run on it. It was built in 1928 at a princely cost of £250. The idea being to link Kew with the public golf course across the Yarra. During the 1934 floods, the bridge was washed downstream away from the Kew Lunatic Asylum. They built a new bridge further downstream. It pretty much resembled the earlier bridge and so they gave it the same name. Close to Keynes Bridge is one of Melbourne's most historic establishments, a boathouse established by the Byrne family back in 1863. It was the first on the Yarra River and they called it Riversdale. These days we all refer to it as the Studley Park Boathouse. It's been restored a few times and remains the oldest public boathouse on the Yarra. An iconic establishment with its fleet of rowboats, canoes and kayaks, all for hire. Melbournians like to park their backsides under the hundred year old elm trees, drink coffee and maybe have lunch or just hire a boat and impress family and friends with their special rowing prowess. The Fairfield Pipe Bridge is slightly upriver from Studley Park in Fairfield. It's just south of the Fairfield Boathouse. The bridge was built in 1878 primarily to carry water from the Yan Yin Reservoir to Kew. And just like Keynes Bridge, it didn't survive the 1934 floods. But in the Pipe Bridge's case, they built it very close to the site of the original bridge and so to this day it continues to move water and people across the Yarra. Fairfield Park Boathouse and Tea Gardens is another nice spot to spend an afternoon. The place was established in 1908 by a bloke called John St. Clair. He had ideas of becoming a picnic, camping and refreshment room area. The place has seen a few changes over the years, including in 1923 being raised about 12 foot to try and reduce flood damage. Like most old places, it's been renovated and had additions like the deck and the terrace area. They now provide light meals, Devonshire teas and that type of stuff. They also make a feature of having traditional hand-built English rowing skiffs to hire and paddle around in. Next to the Fairfield Boathouse is the Ivanhoe Northcote Canoe Club. Uh, for some unknown reason, they don't have anything to do with canoes. They're all about kayaks. Very keen about them, it seems. If you're even half interested in seeing what it's like, just slip down and they'll let you have a crack in one of their club kayaks. Check out their website for more info if you want to. The Yarra River has, over the years, been called by many names, but at some point in time, a bunch of ex-poms mistranslated another Wurundjeri term and came up with Yarrow Yarrow, which means ever-flowing. Of course, all it took was a bit of thick Aussie slang and everybody started calling it the Yarra Yarra River. A couple of generations on and fueled with a bit of She'll Be Right, mate, the wording was shortened to simply Yarra, and so now it's listed on all the maps as the Yarra River. 
People love to paddle all sorts of craft up and down the river, often between both the boathouses. Bellbird Park is roughly halfway between the two. It's a nice little picnic area and a wonderful place to watch the watercraft passing by. Some paddle furiously if there's a deadline of sorts. Others just drift along, enjoying the sense of nature as they float aimlessly down the river, soaking up the sunshine and enjoying the slight hint of mist from the overhanging trees. Occasionally boaters may also notice wee small particles coming down from the trees that overhang the river. If this ever happens, it's probably not a good idea to look up because the mist and unusual particles are generally caused by the inhabitants of the trees rather than the trees themselves. This is the home of Victoria's largest colony of grey-headed flying foxes, which is the largest of the Australian fruit bats. It's still a cute little animal that hangs from these trees throughout the day. Over summer, the colony can swell to over 30,000, but during winter, the population falls to around 6,000. The grey-headed flying foxes have been steadily immigrating to Melbourne for more than 100 years, mostly because of a more reliable food supply. Now here's an interesting piece of information. One quarter of all mammal species in the world are bats. How about that? I didn't know it. Most people do not realise just how essential flying foxes are to the health of native forests. Although commonly known as fruit bats, their favourite food is actually the pollen and nectar from eucalypt blossoms. Normally birds and insects get all the credits, but the fact is flying foxes are one of the most effective seed dispersers and pollinators in the forest. Their larger body size combined with a nice fluffy fur coat allows much more pollen to stick to them and likely to be transported anything up to 100 kilometres in one night. It is estimated that a single flying fox can disperse up to 60,000 seeds in just one night. <coughs> Sadly though, although there appears to be a lot of them, these flying foxes are listed as a threatened species. <coughs> oh. <coughs> now, don't get too concerned about flying fox excrement when you're paddling your boat. Fact is, they have a really fast metabolism and food travels completely through their gut in less than about six minutes. So, because of this, they've normally done their biggest poops closer to where they feed at night. By the time they get back home to base, there's little in them other than maybe a good fart or two. They are very entertaining to watch up close, especially as night starts to come on and they wake up and start getting ready to fly off to get food. Some of them are a tad on the grumpy side, mainly because they're being disrupted. A number of them just want to have that extra bit of sleep in. Maybe a big night out with the crew last night. And let's face it, who wants an early chat with anybody who hasn't cleaned and flossed their teeth? <laughs> the spectacle at sunset is hundreds of these small creatures take to the sky as really quite incredible. It's a truly unique sight when they fly out in large numbers with the city of Melbourne as their backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> 